بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلاة تخرجنا بها من اوحال الرحم وتوضح لنا ما اشكر حتى يفهم انك تعلم ما نعلم ما انت تعلم الغيوب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله thank you for having me this is probably rarely that I come back to this I studied here for about four years at the Arabic department and, uh, and I studied Arabic studies here graduating in about 2002 and when I was here in the green room it was tiny and they had these awful green mats you know the mats that you have a uh, when you're in the computer rooms and stuff, they're really rough. <laughs> still got it in there. Are they still got it? Yeah. <laughs> when you come up, you make sure you've got a mark on your head after <laughs> Yeah, so that you've developed and I'm doing. <laughs> so, um, the first thing, that we're talking about the topic of the, uh, the evening is attaining taqwa. But I will try to bring in, it's a general Imani topic, uh, but I will try to bring in the brothers wanted to, uh, Brother Junaid, to sort of introduce Hadith and stuff. And so I'll base it around, uh, I've based it around a few hadith from the other side of Hina, we no reason at all. But the first of all, I'm going to pose a question to, to uh, you, is uh, because initially, before we proceed for anything, the most important thing is our intentions. And we can use the university, because I'd like to use these, this talk as something that's relevant to you as students, is that why did you come to university? You know, when I, I didn't come to university to study when I when I was in 1998, my intention to come to university was to run away from my parents, get away from them. It was free grants in those times, <coughs> was paid for, and uh, freedom. You know, that's what my intention was. Um, so what was your, I mean, what were your intentions? I mean, what intention, what were your intentions coming to university, Mr. Zafran? Yeah. Become a dentist. Become a dentist. And why did you want to become a dentist? It's a halal income. It's a halal income. Easy income. Yeah. What's your name? I'm Jamal. Jamal. Where are you from? I'm from North of London. North of London. What are you studying? Medicine. Medicine. Why did you choose to study medicine? So mum wanted me to do medicine. <laughs> 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 Honest so answer. Truth. I wanted to do it as well, but right. she wanted to do more than I did. And why Leeds? Why Leeds? Because Leeds, I, I got the offer and I got the grades for Leeds. So sometimes we see even the students even like when I was, for example, I studied Arabic studies and I was intending to study ancient history at Leeds. And when someone says, why did you choose Arabic then? So I didn't even choose Arabic. I flunked all my grades. I didn't get the grades I was supposed to achieve. And I just phoned the university and said, give me whatever you've got. I just want to get away from home. So that was my intention. And when we look at you, most university students today, they're not the model student. Um, in fact, there was a, a bit of research done on the typical American student, and they found that he actually spends 15% of his time actually studying. The rest is socialising, sleeping, eating, and all these sorts of things. And we, when we look at the dunya and, uh, and where we are in today, that's generally we have to look at ourselves because we could use the university example as the dunya itself. You know, why did we, we came into this world? What's our intentions here? What's our purpose here? And those students who have a real purpose and a drive and why they're really studying this thing, they're going to go into university. They're not going to be distracted by all those the distractions that are around there. And they, they, they realise that the, 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 maybe the, the government or the institutions that are funding them to come here, some of us, okay, <coughs> that they've got responsibility on their shoulders to actually study properly and get the best. They realise they've got these libraries here and they've got access to knowledge unlike they might have in their homelands or in their hometowns and so forth. And so they really, put the, uh, they really come with purpose and they come out with the best grades and they come out to achieve greatness. And that's how we have it. But most of us, we don't, do we? We don't really have a real purpose and focus. We get distracted by many, many things at university. We end up with huge debts. Yeah, huge debts. Of, like when I first came to university, I thought free loan is free, no interest, nothing. I thought fantastic, one thousand six hundred pounds, and I spent it on all sorts of wildness. And then I became a Muslim in the first year of my studies. And then I went, my goodness me, why did I even take that? That good, that that loan, I was crazy, and I didn't even. I've only just paid it off now, and that's. Uh, 12 years later. <laughs> so uh, we have to look, and this is how we have to see ourselves on this university campus. We have to see us, ourselves in this greater world. So where we go in, 
what's our direction? And when we, uh, when we uh, review our intentions and we understand our role in this world, then we gain taqwa. Okay? We, th that's the first step. And what's, uh, what's very interesting is uh, you know, that there's so many temptations and so, the university life is extremely difficult. Okay? But through the tests and the tribulations, we gain great reward with Allah SWT. And we have to remember that uh, the Sahaba, in the time of the Prophet وسلم, there were women and men walking around the Kaaba, hardly clothed. Okay? There was usury, there was uh, people abusing other people's rights, there was fornication, there was all sorts of monstrosities going on in society. But they didn't say, oh, we can't deal with this, we've got to run away. Rather, they saw that as they have to stand up and they have to speak out if need be, or they have to guard their eyes and guard their lips if need be. And they use that as a pur their purpose in order to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, this is what Allah, Allah has put us in a test. And what's interesting is Imam Nawawi, in his collection of hadith, you know, they are the Salihin, in a very famous hadith, that many uh, s uh, people, s sermons, uh, delivered in many sermons, is in the dunya hulwatun khadira, that this dunya, this world, uh, is hulwa, is sweet, khadira, and green, it's fresh. Yeah? We're thrown into university, everything's sweet and fresh put before us. We get all sorts of people giving us leaflets and flies, come to this, come to that, all sorts of distractions. And then he says, Allah And Allah has placed you as vice generals, as representatives in her, in, in her, in the, in the earth, in this dunya. Okay, for yandaru kaifa ta'amalun, or kaifa ta'amalun. And he's going to, then he's going to see what you're going to do. And he's going to see how you're going to act. So you've been thrown into each university, Okay, and now he's going to see, or this, which is this world, the university. What are you going to come out with? What are you going to graduate with in this terms of this dunya? And he says, oh, now we're seeing. So first of all, we realize that Allah is the one that's put us in this situation in the first place. And so we feel a sense of purpose to Allah, just as he's given us this body and given us all these limbs. You know, that we've got a sense of purpose. Allah's given this body. And that's the first thing we realize. We've got responsibility, we've got a purpose in this university and in this world to come out with results. And there's going to be temptations. فَاتَّقُوا dunya, And so be feary. Be fe fear the dunya. Be wary. Be conscious huh? of the dunya, of this world. And, he says, and then the Prophet ﷺ says, And for you young men, فَاتَّقُوا nisa, And be feary of women. He says, because that's your... He says, فَإِنَّ أَوَّلَ الْفِتْنَةٍ فَإِنَّ أَوَّلَ الْفِتْنَةٍ The first tribulation. The first tribulation that was for the tribe of the people of Bani Israel, the Israelites, Canaan and Nisa was the women. So he says the first thing that a man has to be conscious of is his role and his responsibilities of, and there's many temptations out there. But as a one hadith, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure of the uh, authenticity of it, but it's related by Qushayri and he says it's al he says that the Prophet, it's related that the Prophet says, he who looks up and gazes upon a woman and guards his, he quickly, as soon as he sees them, guards his eyes. Allah gives him a sweetness in his ibadah, unlike anything of this world. Okay? And so this is, we've got to put things in a context. Okay? And we've got to realize that it's difficult, life's difficult for both men and women, both the sisters and brothers here. But when we strive, and we have a sincere and genuine purpose, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not let us down. And how many I lived, when I was in Leeds, I lived with Omani, brothers from Oman. Was, I was crazy when I was young. Uh, I, I, I came back from Morocco, I started the year in Morocco. I came back in Leeds Grand Mosque, didn't want to lose my Arabic, grabbed the first Arab and said, I want to live with you. <laughs> okay, and he happened to be an Omani. Okay, Omani is very sweet people, mashallah, generally. Yeah. And, uh, he, they said they wanted. The, then I, I had the. Uh, they had the. Uh, the uh, committee out basically. There's about seven old man. He's checking me out, thinking, why does he want to live with us? <laughs> and then I was this just innocent little white guy. <laughs> and they, and they, and they said, why do you live with us? I said, I want to keep my Arabic up. And so I live with them. And it, when I lived amongst the Arab students, especially, you see how many of them actually they weren't very practicing when they were in their lands, and they came to university, and they they feel boost. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them a blessing. Why? Because they've come here and now they, they realize what a test it is. And they see other Muslims who are born here and raised here and that they're trying to uh, strive. And they think, you know, why, when, when all my family back home and my friends, they're chasing the dunya. And they've got Islam in front of them. 
and then these people, they're in very, a society that's not even Muslim, and they're striving, and so they feel inspired. And you see many people, they go back to their lands, and they're actually, might have more purpose in their religion than they did before they came. But we've got to keep, how do we maintain that? Because it's very easy to lose it. And uh, Imam Nawawi, uh, in his section, in his Bab al-Taqwa, Imam Nawawi, as a famous, he was a famous sheikh at Sunni scholar, and uh, he was very, he's well known for his books in uh, the Shafi'i school. But one book that he's really famous for, most well renowned for, is the Riyadh al-Salihin, in which he compiled many hadith on the, on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Qur'an, uh, categorizing virtues of the Muslim. And interestingly, his first chapter, is, he starts, this is basically the spiritual path for someone, is that he starts with sincerity. Okay? One's sincerity is ikhlas. Okay, so you, Allah inspires you with an intention, you put something in your mind, and then you think, no, and you, then you have purpose and you drive for it. But before you can really uh, bear, take the fruit from that, is you've got to have Tawbah. And so Imam Nawawi, in the second chapter, he touches upon Tawbah, repentance. You've got to, before you can take that sincerity, and bit, bit, because you say, I'm sincere, I'm going to, I'm going to do my five prayers now, I'm going to sort myself out. I'm going to paint my purpose. I'm going to make my religion my main focus. Allah says, okay, you've made a claim. Now let's see you repent. Because repent's not, oh, Allah, forgive me. And then you get to move it. Repentance is that you turn to Allah, you ask Him uh, to forgive you, and then you have resolve in your heart that you will never turn back. To the best of your ability, you, have, you say, I'm going to try my best. You may slip, but you, you have in your heart, you're, going to, you're not going to turn back and you're going to from now on and if you wrong someone you return that right to them and so forth so sincerity in itself requires you to act and so first of all Allah inspires you sincerity then he gives you repentance then what's the next chapter you remember now he touches on sabr, patience, forbearance and you have to re make the, the repentance is not easy because you've got to keep it up and so he, then he talks about the virtues he brings the virtues of patience and forbearance as you're turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making his attention to him then the next chapter genuineness, sidq that you're true to your word, and you're true in your very state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you try to do it purely for his sake. Not you, that you, you've turned out, you've become righteous, but why you do, why, why, why are you being righteous? It's so you can go back home and your parents can go, mashallah, but uh, <laughs> your mother's crying of happiness and stuff. And, uh, but why are you doing it? You're doing it purely for Give Allah. And how do you, and then the next chapter you uh, Imam Nawi touches on is muraqaba, obser ob observance. Of your, with your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you at all times and you're conscious of that. As we said to the hadith before, فَيَنْظُرُ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ He's looking, he's gazing upon you to see what, what you're doing. And then the next chapter, taqwa. And so all the, Imam Nawi didn't, he didn't just start writing chapters here, there and everywhere about that. There was a, there's an intention, the order of things. And so before we can even have, ta have taqwa, there's certain prerequisites even before that, you know. You've got to be sincere in your and you've got to, in your repentance, you've got to say, you've got to give back the rights of others. You've got to ask for forgiveness from, some, from the people that you've wronged. You've got to try to change your life. Uh, and so this is the importance of taqwa. And most, before we study anything, really, we need to understand what taqwa is. We've got some Arabs here. So what, I mean, what does taqwa mean? I mean, it's a very difficult word to translate into English. I mean, how do we translate it? I mean, what does it mean? It's a general thing. Go on. How would you translate it? It's like to be aware of God. Very good. Whenever you do anything. Yes. Any other translate? How do they usually translate to Quran? Yeah. God fearing. God. Protection. Prote protection. Well done. Okay. God fearing. God fearing. They usually translate it as God fearing. They're God conscious, don't they? Consciousness. Piety. Some people translate yeah. it as piety. It's all got different translations. But we need to go Arabic so beautiful, and it's the real the reason our last part has revealed it in this language and preserved its language is because it gives us a real understanding. Once we translate, the Arabs say to translate is to deceive, yeah, it's to fall, <laughs> because you've only you've only given one angle, aspect of that. So we need to go to the Arabic and understand what taqwa means. It comes from the word, isn't it, waqiya, yeah, wiqaya, to protect. Yeah. Okay. And so essentially, as the sister said, the taqwa is about protecting yourself, putting yourself a shield. They said the Arab says, uh, the scholar says, if it's a shield between you and other, and there's different levels, 
because taqwa, they say the first taqwa is shirk, protecting yourself from shirk, associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we've got shirk al jali, haven't we? Apparent shirk is clear, you know, one who worships Allah alone or one who worships idols and so forth. And then we've got shirk, a shirk khafi, like the hidden shirk, like ostentation and so forth. And many Muslims, even in our behavior, we commit shirk without even thinking about it. For example, someone's panicking so much they feel ill. We, I see this in Morocco. In a, I lived in Morocco for 10 years, and people, uh, you know, the health system's very poor. And so you see these people, they, go, they stand at rich people's doors with their prescriptions. And their, I don't know if you see that in Kuwait, but uh, other countries, like poorer countries, they're like, oh, I see the, help me, help me, help me with my prescription and so forth. And they're chasing down the street and he's trying to get off me, get off me. Yeah. And, uh, and he's they, like, they're, they're, then they end up because they know they're not going anything, they start swearing at him, <laughs> <laughs> cursing him. And you see these people so desperate for that medication. And really, we're, even when we take the medication, we realize there's no power in this medicine in reality. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who puts the power in that thing. This is, a, this is the belief of the Muslims, is that it, we, Allah didn't come along, put power in something, and then leave it. You know, as some Christians may believe, or some of the people, that Allah created the creation and says, I'll leave you to yourself, and I'll step in uh, when, when needed. No, in fact, we realize that there's no strength for hawla or la quwwata. There's no strength and power except on like every single part. And so, and so we commit shirk on a, uh, on a daily level sometimes. We, we believe that thing, well, no, it must, I must have that. And Allah doesn't want it for us. And we, so it's as if we're idolizing that thing. And so at the university, that's very common, we can do those things, you know. We panic and we, we, we lose trust in Allah. Why has Allah done this to us? Why did he fail? I studied this for this midterm exam so hard. Okay, Allah, must, yeah, Allah you, you haven't done anything. You know, we say kufri statements. We make statements that are disbelief in reality if we think about it. And so that's the first level of taqwa, that we protect ourselves from those things. The second one is protect ourselves from sin. Open sin and inward sin. What's out, outward sin, for example, abusing someone and so forth, committing a fornication, uh, acting in usury and so forth, and the sins of the heart, jealousy, hate for somebody and so forth. We put a shield between us and those, those, uh, those uh, the vices. And then they say the next one is of dubious matters. Uh, so we have to start, you know, someone's, we have usually, we have this, the Iman boost. You know, we get the uh, Iman boost, to, especially students, because you've got, you've got too much free, you've got too much free time on your hands, basically. <laughs> yeah? And you start, you think you're Superman, I can take on the world. And one day you say, oh, I'm going to become super Muslim. And you, when I first became Muslim, I, became, I got rid of every material possession, shaved my head, grew my beard as long as it would do, uh, and then slept on the floor, sold everything. And then I realized after six, seven months, it was getting stressful for me. You know, we have to take things little by little. We have to know our, we have to know our levels. You know, we read about one of the, the pious, the righteous pious, and we say, that's me. And you start <laughs> acting like that. And you realize six months, if you're lucky, six months, you burn yourself completely out. And so we have to start at the base. And the first thing is work on our belief with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and avoid sin to the best of our abilities. We try to best finish up the result. And then they say, once you've got a grasp hold of that, then dubious matters. Things, and that's, you know, where the da'ma yuribuka ila mala yuribuk. Leave those uh, affairs that give you doubt to those which don't give you doubt. The problem is, if you give that to someone who's still on the early stages, he start leaving everything. You know, he's still, Allah hasn't given him clarity in his life. He hasn't given him proper taqwa. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in truly you give him good fearing this. He will give you a criterion in which you know what's the right path and what's not. But we have to be careful when we get those little iman boosts of taking it easy at the same time in our life. Allah. And then he says the next stage is we leave the less preferable, khilaf al awla. There's two acts we could do, both are permissible, and you choose the greater one of the two. He says that. And then the last one, the highest station, is that you leave everything that's a distraction from you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is clarified in the Quran, yeah, uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جَنَاحًا Interesting verse this, when we read this, this is the importance of having an exegesis, an explanation of Qur'an, when we read Qur'an to understand what Allah is trying to say to us. There's nothing, there's no, لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جُنَاحًا There's no blame, there's no sin for those who believe and do righteous deeds, 
in that which they eaten, either huh? that, that which they eat, there's no blame on them, whatever they eat, if they have God-fearingness. If I read that, I think, oh, hey, McDonald's, here we come. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get a drink out, it's all right, I've got taqwa. Okay. So this is what... They have god fear, unless as long as they have God-fearingness, taqwa. And believe and do righteous deeds. Then they have God fearing this and believe. And then they have taqwa and they have ihsan. Now you think, why has Allah said taqwa, taqwa, taqwa three times? That's just repetition. Some of the scholars say it's just to emphasize. But no, when you look deep into the real meaning, this was related. There's two, and when we read about it, this is so essential that we have our, that our, our religion is based upon sound knowledge, scholarship, is that that we go back to the sabab al nazul yeah, the asbab al nazul the, 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 uh, the circumstances behind why this uh, verse was revealed. Someone, uh, the Sahaba, when the, uh, the verse of Qur'an was revealed uh, about uh, the for, uh, forbidding of uh, alcohol, of khamar, the Sahaba thought, what about all those believers before the Muslims? They were drinking and they passed away and they, you know, they, were, they passed away drinking. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, no, those who had right who believed and have righteous they did righteous deeds and they had taqwa, it wasn't even for haram on them at the time. And so they're rewarded, don't worry about that. And so that's that's one of the circumstances that's one of the uh, situations it was revealed in that. And so it's not talking about you can chat, you can do whatever you want as long as you've got taqwa, because when you have taqwa, the fruits, you know, you see the fruits of the action. And uh, so, and then he says, And the scholars say the first one is, which I'll we'll touch on in another talk, inshallah, when we come, is the Hadith of Jibreel. They say the first stage of taqwa is Islam. Yeah? They believe and do righteous deeds. Islam is practice. Yeah? And then they believe and have faith. Now, this is true faith. Now, this is a level up from the first Iman. The first Iman was, I believe that there's one God. I believe that Allah is all seeing. I believe that He's all hearing. But why, why do you backbite? Why do you lie? Why do you cheat then? No, I believe it. I believe my Allah. Well, obviously, that belief, that's, that's here, but your belief hasn't hit here. And so that's where you've got true Iman now. You realize that Allah SWT is there watching you and so forth. It actually has an impact on your state. Then he says, The next one, then they believe and have Ihsan. And Ihsan is this last stage we talked about that basically perfect, up to the utmost human perfect uh, qualities that someone can attain per per perfectness in the perfect My English is going. <laughs> what is it? Perfect. Perfection. Perfection, there you go. Perfection <laughs> is that uh, one does actually sees Allah in his worship, huh? as in the Hadith of Jibreel, what we touch upon, okay? And ta'budullah ka'annaka tara, and you do everything for Allah's sake. It comes to a state where you, you see everything as a distraction other than what Allah is calling to you. you see, in every situation you're in, you say, what does Allah want from me in this situation? And you're, you're, you're fervent in order to do that. And you've got no taste or no, you find no sweetness in being distracted by this and that. Okay? That's a very high level. Okay? And so we have to take it easy. And we start slowly and we build up into that stage. And so this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu ma'al, uh, Wallahu yuhibbun muhsineen. And he says at the end of the verse, and Allah loves, loves those who are muhsin. As if Allah is saying, this is the stage that I want for you. I want you to reach the level of ihsan. Okay, it's interesting. After Maghrib, Maghrib prayer, it's recommended for us to read Surah Al-Waqi'ah. It? It's one of the virtues to read Surah Al-Waqi'ah. Surah Al-Waqi'ah, he gives it. It's like it's, he's saying, he says, the sabiqun, the sabiqun, those forerunners, those who are outstrippers, those who are at the front. Then ashabul yameen. Don't, you know, be, as if Allah is encouraged us. He mentions the sabiqin first. Uh, those who are at the forefront. And, and then he says, Ashab al Yameen, and then he mentions their rewards and so forth. And he says, Don't be from Ashab al Shima, those from the left hand side. And so it's, even, it's like university here, you know what he's saying, Allah's saying, go, go and get that A start, get that, what is it, first, get that first, yeah. get that first with, cla with first class honours, okay? But okay, if you get a C, B, C, that's okay, I'll still give you the uh, hat and you still get the scroll. <coughs> but don't get, don't, don't fail, okay? Don't fail. Don't disappoint yourself, and dis you know, in the, in the next life you're going to be finally thoroughly disappointed, and so and so and so forth. So these are the. This is what this is taqwa, and I've already got, I've only got four minutes left. So four, ten minutes left. And then you're going to ask me, okay? But I want this. 
I want it now. I want Takwa. You've inspired me, and I feel the really urge now. And this is like an, these Imani. This is an Imani topic. You know that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala even inspired you to come and sit with me and to talk about this topic. The Takwa is that Allah wants good for you. You know, He wants to bless you. But the danger of these gatherings is that we get the uh, euphoria and I feel good now, and then you go back and say, "Got out my system, feeling pious now. Let's go back to the dunya." You know, and it all goes within a week. And that's why a very famous statement by a very famous scholar called Sidi Ibn al Iskandari. He says, "La tuzakiyan nawari dan, la ta'alimu thamrataha." He says, "Don't pure, don't think uh, the an inspiration that comes to you in your life. You know, Allah gives you something. You you feel so. I'm going to knock out twenty rakas tonight. I'm feeling it tonight. <laughs> and uh, you know, and you're feeling so good. I feel Allah's with me, and I'm watching. He's watching me, and I feel so close to Allah. He says, "Be careful of." Uh, of this, these feelings, he says. That is a key in the word. He doesn't let him with them. He says, He says, The intent, the reason behind clouds is not the rain. You know, the farmer, he sees the rain come, and the rain comes down, and they think they're celebrating the rain. Okay? He says, He says, The purpose behind the clouds are, He says that they bear fruit. Now, what's the point of celebrating with the rain, the farmer, if he hasn't, doesn't even produce any crops in the end? And so we get, we, we come here, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us, but when you can thank Allah, and when you know Allah's forgiven you, and really you've, you've got sincere repentance, is that you never go back on the sin. You know, you, you tell, you, now you feel Allah's pushed you forward, and you, you're not even falling back. You think, you look at yourself, you judge six months later, subhanAllah, you know, what a changed person I am. And that when you parent someone you haven't met for six months, they meet with you and they realise, well, you've changed. You, know, you can meet, you can say someone, he can go abroad and study for 10, 20 years. I know one brother, he studied, he's in Yemen. Okay? Yemen, you can't sin even if you wanted to sin. Yeah, there's nothing to sin. You got all that sand. Yeah? <laughs> he's, he's in Hadramut. There's nothing there. They're all pious people there. And, uh, and uh, he comes back. I haven't seen him for 10 years. So I know, he's very blessed. <coughs> Good. But I don't feel he's really changed. Okay? And so it's not even about the environment you're in. It's about you taking the, 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 uh, the, the grit, you know, gritting it by your teeth, the meat, and really striving for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have to, so when you, people see you've come before, they see a change. You've got to judge yourself and, and make that change and, and, and assess yourself constantly. How, am I the same as last week or the week before or the week before that? And if you see that no, Allah has changed you, you have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that blessing. So, how do we gain taqwa? How do we gain this gift? Okay. The first thing we have to see, uh, and a lot of people we complain about this, is let's look at our prayer to see if we even have taqwa first. Because the first guide of to, uh, whether we have any sense of taqwa is our prayer. And it's an ultimate manifestation of whether we actually, uh, of the highest state, the ihsan we were talking about, where you, sh you, you're scared of anything, for thinking of anything besides Allah. Because as soon as you say Allahu Akbar, you shouldn't be thinking of anything but Allah. Okay, we, sh we shouldn't be thinking of that. But uh, I'm a weak so I'm saying, Allahu Akbar. What do we, what's Allahu Akbar mean? Allahu Akbaru, I mean, siwa. That's the meaning. Allah is greater. What did you say? Yeah, I said Allah is greater. Yeah, okay. Allah is greater <laughs> than everything else other than Him. And that's Allahu Akbar. And as if we push the dunya away, isn't it? You know, we're into a divine communion, munaja. As if we're, we're addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with His words. And if we ponder upon the prayer and really understood it, poof, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't want to come out of it. Okay? And then we start Allahu Akbar. And so we said Allah is greater than everything. So why are we thinking about other than Him then? As soon as Allahu Akbar. <laughs> God, that guy's got really ugly feet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Please, with next time, you really stop wearing tight trousers in prayer. Yeah. Okay. okay. We, 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 as soon as we say Allah Akbar, we're, we're straight away. We're straight, that's why we say I will be laying with Shaitan and the You know. And then, so we have to accept that's the, the, the prayer is a gauge to tell us where we're at. So if we after we say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and then we, we look, how much of that prayer was we actually conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That shows if, how much taqwa we have. Okay? If we were at a state where we were fighting it constantly, stop thinking about that and bringing ourselves back. And that's the gift of the Qur'an, is that that is the thing that we spoke, is, that's what keeps us at the focus. The focus is the Qur'an. Okay? Is that when, when we're reciting the Qur'an, we're contemplating on the meanings to keep us focused in our prayer. 
And so that's the importance of Arabic language, or even if we never can be able to study Arabic, because some people just can't do it, it's too difficult, is that we try to at least memorize the meanings, you know, and we be aware of those meanings in our prayer when we're doing it. We can't just be chicken pecking like it's not going to be of any benefit to us whatsoever. And so we, let's not kid ourselves. Let's look at our prayer and study. So then you say, okay, okay, I'm lousy. I'm lousy, I haven't got anything. So how do we gain taqwa? How are we going to gain that? First and foremost, the first thing we start with, as we said, is that we think about the, uh, the repercussions of our actions. Yeah, even in the dunya, I used to use that. You know, it's many sins you say, oh, I'll never do that sin. If I do that sin, I know my dad will find out. You know, <laughs> it's like, I'll give you an example. With, it's a good example with the Asian lads here in Bradford. And Brad, Bradford better than Leeds because Leeds is, in Bradford they say, if I go down to that nightclub, that taxi man knows my dad. <laughs> yeah. And if I go there, it's going to get back to him. So there's no way I'm going, I want to go down to the club, but I'm not going to go because my dad will find out and then he's going to kill me. You know? <laughs> so, and so even to, you know, that, that, there's a blessing in that. Even though you haven't, you're not, it's not really a high station. That that's like fear of the hellfire, isn't it? You're, they're calling the, as Imam Nawawi states in his commentary on his Arabic Nawawi classifies people as the slaves of the fire and the slaves of the sorry the, the worship of the slave who only does things because he's scared of getting a licking. And then he says the the the, the worship of the merchant is only doing because he wants he wants to give all these rewards in paradise and so forth. These are acceptable levels. Allah accepts them. But he says the greatest level is ibadatul ahrar. The worship of the free man. He does it purely for the love of his maker. And that's a very, very high station of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah blessed him. And so even doing your perspective, we can think about that. We can say, I'm not going to do it because you know it won't get back to me. And, it, and then we can think of the ukhrawi, the, of the afterlife. In reality, if we think about it, we have angels recording everything we do. Okay, that's reality. Imagine yourself, you've got a journalist from the new, uh, from uh, News of the World. He's going to write, he's going to kill you. Yeah. Now, he's the one on the left. Yeah, okay. <laughs> on the News of the World, he's, gonna, he's looking for some goss. Okay. And then the, uh, the uh, obviously the angels are beyond this. It's just an example just to, to, for you to understand. And then the other one, he's from Guardian. They're pretty good at yeah. aren't they? Guardian, he's from the Guardian, he's wanting to write your good deeds. If you, you, know, if you, you, you actually were conscious that there's this man... With a, from the Guardian and this man from the News of the World walking around with you constantly, writing down everything you say and everything you do, you'll be, you know, you, you, you're going to have, to, you're going to be very cautious of what you're doing. And so Allah, out of His blessings, told us He's put those angels there for a blessing for us in order just to contemplate on our actions. But it's so easy to forget, but we've got to constantly remind ourselves constantly. And one of the best ways to remember uh, to do that is to think of death. If you don't think of death, if we don't think of death at least once, once in our day, we've got dead hearts. Yeah. If we don't think of death, and to think of death for us is not like you know we're goths. You know, <laughs> we go home and we've got a coffin ready. You know, and we've got these boots that are huge. That, you know, we're, I don't know. No, what what it means, <laughs> actually, actually <laughs> death boots. for us is a beautiful thing because it makes us alive. I remember when I was in Morocco, I had the worst landlord. He was the most money-driven man I ever saw. He had this operation on his back. And if anyone knows his own family's of back operations, or any do you know, doctors here, it's very dangerous on the spine. And he was in such pain. That man, before I knew it, in Morocco, he had a tasbih around his neck, he had a jalaba on, and he was like going, Allah, Allah. Because you know, he'd actually become a living human being now. You know, Allah had blessed him, because you know, he thought he was going to die. And so, actually, death for us, you know those movies where the movie where the man thinks he knows he's got four months to live or something? Mm. Yeah, that you see that he becomes a nice person and he's running around trying to do as much good as he possibly can. So death is a blessing. I mean, it's not something to become morbid about. It's something to actually bring, bring purpose to us. And that's why the Prophet said, uh, enumerate and uh, think much upon the thing that crushes your desires, <coughs> destroys your desires. And they said, what that? He says, think about the death. And it, bring, and it, it enables you to put all those desires away and have focus. It really puts things into perspective. The next thing is to, you can't have taqwa of Allah if you don't have knowledge of what he wants of you. And so you have to learn your religion, what you need, the essentials of your religion that you need in your life to practice, you need to learn your religion. And you need to find out, you need to ask, what does Allah require of me in this situation? As a student, what does Allah require of me? Is it permissible for me to do this? Is it not permissible for me to do that? And so forth. You need to learn about your religion in order to grow closer to Allah. 
And the last point, and the fundamental one, is you need someone who's actually who's, who's a, a role model for you. Fundamental. As Allah says, Ya ayyudhalina amanu, ya ayyudhalina amanu taqullaha wa kunu as-sadiqeen. He says, oh Allah, fear of Allah, and be with the genuine ones. Those who are genuine with Allah. Because we are imitators by nature. The moment you were born, you were, you're, you're imitating. How you learn language is you imitate other people. How you learn habits is you're imitating. The moment you come out of your mother, you know, she's going, goody, goody, ga. You know, you're trying to go, goody, goody, ga, but you've got no teeth and you, know, you can't do it. You are an imitation. You're not genuine. You're not unique in that way. Sorry to burst your bubble. Okay? <laughs> you are a pure imitation in a mix of all different things. And, and so, in reality, you, and we need to imitate. But we need the model. What's the model? The prophetic model, of course. And people in our lives, it's not. It's all right to read about the prophets of the last time and try it. But we need to see people who are actually applying it in our lifetime. Because it's like reading medicine through the book. And not having this, you know, the teacher that's telling you how to actually do it, it's impossible. We can get to a certain stage and we do that, and then we might cut the wrong vein, okay? <laughs> but the, um, the, essentially, we need someone who's applying it because it has such a profound effect on us when we see someone. And they say, in order to gain taqwa, you have to gain good company, but at the same time, you've got to avoid bad company. You've got to cuff up. Those friends that keep dragging you down, you've got to try your best. You know, even me, as when I became Muslim, I had, I had friends that used to go on the internet and watch all sorts of atrocious things. I just got to the point where I just felt disgusted by it. And we, naturally, I never really severed my relationship with them, but you just become disinterested. Before, you know, it becomes natural for you to be good at it. As you go on the stage to Allah, you just, they're just talking about rubbish. And you sit and say, oh, I'm actually wasting my time with these people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you have that sincere, he starts sending you people. They can bless him. There's a famous hadith on the other side of here, isn't there? Where the man who killed 99 people. And then, what did he say essentially how you repent when he went to the man that eventually gave him the sound advice? He says, you've got to get out of here. And you've got to go to that village where there's righteous people. And so in the university, and we do it even in our studies. What do we do? We say, I got D in my, te my midterm test. I'm going to have to sort myself out. So you don't sit next to a... That guy <laughs> that just kept distracting you and throwing paper airplanes at your head in your lesson. What do you do? You see, look at that SWAT who you were taking the Mickey out of at the beginning of the, <laughs> of the year. You know who had that? Who was polishing the apple for the for the lecturer? Okay. Now now you now you've got your apple with him as well. <laughs> you know. And so and he's your and and you start sitting with him and you study with him and do and you start then you start progressing. It's the same thing in your religion. Is that you've got to take good company and try to get yourself away from bad company, and our last point out of them facilitates things. Alhamdulillah. We'll stop on, on that point, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Any, any questions? Um, right. I've got, you've got six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> any, any questions? Yes? You said that there's levels of topic. Yes. There's the, the three. So, can you repeat the question, please? Yes. So, the sister she asked, you, you looked at three levels of taqwa. What are they, the three? And so, we, we talked about that, that first, didn't we? Um, which is in Surah Al Ma'idah, verse 93. Okay. Um, is that the first one is protecting yourself from outward shirk, associating. And we talked about the two levels of shirk there. The, one, the next one is sin, inwardly and outwardly. Sin, hatred, jealousy, that's your inward, outwardly. It's about actually wronging people and not praying and so forth. And then the next one is dubious and less preferable acts. Okay, where you come to a point where basically you're doing and you're making sure everything is the best, the thing that Allah would really love from you. And someone brought up a really interesting issue. Like most non-Muslims always tell you about this thing. Like, you Muslims are so you know you're caught up in all the details. You know what does God really care about? You know whether you know whether you missed your big toe in wudu. You know, <laughs> the Muslims bring this up, don't they? Say, but they've forgotten the point. When you're in love with the divine, you, the small detail, the, small, the details matter. You know, and you'll find out when you're married. <laughs> you know, is that when your wife, she says, "What day is it?" And then you start sweating. <laughs> 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 the test, the ultimate test. <laughs> you, you're, you're gonna lose no matter. You might as well just you know, give up while you can. Is this the anniversary? Okay. <laughs> And you see, that man who really loves his wife, he, start, he says, oh, I, I remember our first anniversary, I mean, the candles are like this, and, you know, and, uh, and, the, and she had the food, and it was a chicken was placed like this. You know? <laughs> As for the husband, you know, the details matter if, for the one who's in love. 
As for the one that does, he says, oh, she, I'll just give her a tenner. There you go, darling. <laughs> go buy yourself something nice. <laughs> that, you know, that, that, you know, you're going to get a letter. One day you're going to walk home. Dear John, okay, it's all over. You know, she's, she's gone back to her family. And so the details do matter. And so the one who has taqwa, he's, you know, he wants to please Allah, even in the smallest things. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Any more questions? Um, yes. we, we were talking about shirk and... Um, Sometimes, like, say, for example, when you're praying Salah, somebody will walk into the room and you kind of automatically kind of, like, readjust yourself, you'll become, like, yes. straight up. Is that haram or...? Well, it's, 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 it's a last word of exposing you. Yeah. yeah. Because in reality, the real... The, the, they say if you're just a uh, worship... You know, when, you're, when you do genuine worship, is that you do it whether people are with you or not. Yeah. Okay. But that's our level, is that, you know, for example, someone pushes Harris to the front to lead the prayer. Yeah. He's, when, he, when he's on his own, when he's doing a silent prayer, Dhuhr, you know, he's just alhamdulillah, my man, and my man, he's not even thinking about it. Now he becomes Qali Abdul Basa. You know, now, now you know there's Riyadh there, they're showing off there. Why are you reciting? And that's why some of so Imam Malik himself, uh, Rahimullah, he disliked people to put, uh, you know, he, he said, there's a difference of opinion about this. You know, the, the hadith, he said, Zayinu uh, aswatakum bil Qur'an. Or Zayinul Qur'an bi aswatakum, sorry, Zayinul Qur'an bi aswatakum. He says, beautify the Qur'an with your, uh, with your, uh, with your voices. Yeah, with your voices. He says, what this means is, Zayinul aswatakum bil Qur'an. No, beautify your voices with Qur'an. He says, the Qur'an doesn't need beautifying, it's beautiful in itself. And, it's, and he liked people to actually uh, recite very simply. He didn't like, and it was even disliked in the, the, the you know, the Adhan. You know, you've got a Saudi, you've got, they're like pop stars, some of these guys, you know, yeah. put on the mic, boom. <laughs> 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 He comes up. Who's the you know who's the who's the, who's the muaddin for today? You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know they actually the early scholars dislike that. They, they said you know I'm doing that. There's a difference of opinion about it. But what I'm to the point I'm trying to make is we have to rectify our intentions. You know, and so you know even when we're praying, how does you got to keep the same recitation that you normally could? Even recite like under bus all the time. <laughs> you know. So that is a, that is an element. <coughs> Any other questions? Sure. You mentioned earlier that uh, when you're trying to uh, pray, for example, as part of if you're doing if you're working and then you have to quickly <coughs> pray Zohar or mm. Salah so Obviously, we, we are all going to be working in that kind of environment one day, and it's quite hard to kind of maintain that same level of um, attention to your prayer. Do you have any practical tips in terms of maintaining? Well, in fact, this happens to a lot of people. It's very, it's a very important point, and that's when you're thrown. In, you, you know, it was easy to be pious when you're a student. The question is, ladies and gentlemen, here is that how do you, you know, in, as students, it's easy to be pious. Honestly, really, it's not. I mean, it's, a, it's a, you, you've, got, you've got a lot of free time. You can do all the sunnahs and nafals and tajj and everything. And then Allah says, you know, it's like, it's like university life, and then you're thrown into the work world and you've got to apply everything. It's difficult now. And, and the, your, your deen is the same thing, you're thrown into the dunya and uh, you have to apply it and you can't do most of the things. And for a woman that's even more relevant, you know, that a woman, she was like superwoman in her ibadah and then she's married now, now she's got children, but your obligations change and you, everything is an act of worship, okay? And for example, I'll give you an example of, your, of what you said. Like, for example, you've got Dhuhr, for example, you've got your four sunnahs before, haven't you? You've got your four fard and your two sunnahs after, for example. You say, I want, you should really leave those sunnahs. Yeah, they're sunnah mu'akadah, they're stressed. Okay? And if you haven't got an excuse, you're not allowed to leave, you shouldn't leave them, and you're sinful for doing so, because you're leaving the sunnah of the Prophet But if you're in a workplace, and, you're, you, and you know that you're, it's going to wind your boss up, because you've got like, uh, deadlines to meet and so forth, and uh, you've only really, you should, you've got to, uh, you know, you've, you've only got time to pray your forefathers or something, it's actually more, it's a more, more of an obligation for you just to pray those four fathers. You're actually doing a disservice to your religion by praying those things. You're outward, out, and you, by doing that, is an act of worship in itself. Um, and <coughs> so we've got to get our minds, understand what worship is in, in reality. Okay? It's, and uh, even with the wife, you know, she says, Oh, I was reading so much Qur'an, I was doing a khatam of Qur'an every month, now I'm married, I can't do it with him. Her actually doing the housework in the house and so forth is an act of worship. And actually, if she, she's got to realise that. And that's where taqwa really comes into place, because you're aware that Allah's put you in this situation. 
Okay, and so you're thankful, you're grateful, and that's the ultimate form of worship, is that you're grateful for the situation, the place that you're in. And uh, a very famous uh, righteous man from Morocco, Sidi Ali Jemen, he said, well, do you know what a willy is? A saint, like a man of Allah. I'll give you a definition. He says, when he's in the shade, he doesn't want to be in the sun. And when he's in the sun, he doesn't want to be in the shade. That's, he's happy where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put him, and he deals with the situation. You know, he realizes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put him in the situation, and he, he makes sure his intention behind every act he does is for Allah's sake. You know, so when the husband comes home and doesn't even appreciate the food, you know, this is very hard. I mean, I'm not saying it like, and his wife, his wife says, you know, I, I, I was pleasing, I was doing it for you, so you are Allah's sake. I wasn't doing it for that toe reg's sake. <laughs> you are Allah. Okay? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives openings then. Because he says, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ When you have fear of Allah and you're conscious of Allah and that you're doing it for his sake, Allah will open up a door for you where, for, whereby you didn't even know it was coming to come. Okay? And so we, we, in our lives and here, in our situations, we've got to ask, what does Allah require? That's the ultimate muttaqi, the one who's got God fearing this, is that he says every situation, what's Allah want from in this situation? And that's who he's got in his mind. <coughs> and you know, and that, that's when we get religious, we start worrying, oh, but what's my mother going to say when I come home with this beard? Oh, she's going to say, show it, shave it off, and so forth. Then you're not doing it, you won't even, the beard wasn't, you might as well shave it off, if you've got, if you're going to back down, because, because you won't even, you didn't even the beard for the sake of Allah and his messenger. You, you know, because as soon as a test comes, Allah's put you in that test, you're backing down. Okay, no, you have to rectify your intention. What everyone else says, I'm not bothered. And I'll take it, and I'll be respectful, and I'll just let it bounce off me. This is a test that Allah's showing me, that I, 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 he's put me in a situation here now, whereby I, I, I'm being uh, shown whether I'm doing it for Allah or I'm not doing it for Allah. Okay? <coughs> And in the workplace, so you're going to be tested. You're going to have non-Muslims saying sort of all sorts of crazy things. But the thing is that we have to show impeccable manners, okay? And uh, we have to we have to strive. And we've been in certain situations where we'd love to do loads of ibadah, but that's not what Allah requires of us. He doesn't require. And the perfect example is the woman on her menses. The woman on her menses. So they said related from Sayyidah Aisha radiAllahu anha. And she says the woman that's on her menses. And she gets up at every prayer. She gets every prayer time. She goes to her musalla in the place she prays. Okay, because it's required. Women, it's recommended for them that they don't pray everywhere in the house. They have an allocated place where they switch off. Basically, that's their musalla. And that she, she says, if she sits there and she makes dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa taala for the time it would make her to pray her father prayer, she's rewarded a reward like a, or the greatest of prayers. You know, because she realizes that. Allah doesn't want you to pray, which is crazy if you think about it. You know, Allah doesn't want you to pray, huh? No, He doesn't want something else from you. Okay, and we it, we know workplaces. We've got to think like that. We've got to get ourselves out of the salah, zakah. There's other aspects as well. And what does Allah? What's the act of worship here? The act of worship when someone's giving you abuse is just to smile and say, okay, you know, that's your act of worship now. Not, not to come back and just grab your chair and smack him right in the head. You know? Any more questions? Um, unfortunately, you see a lot of uh, Muslims doing a lot of haram things these days, in university especially. And um, I just want to hear your advice on how you think that, as other Muslims, how you should give dawah and uh, break the hegemony. <coughs> the thought process where they think that these things are okay. That chasing the things that the kafir want are okay. Right. Whereas they should be considered wrong in their mind. Yeah, I mean it's very difficult, and uh, this this uh, this is Amr bin Maruf and Nahyan and Munkar, which is one of the greatest uh, blessings, and it's something that's very precious. You know, enjoying the good and forbidding the evil, but it's got to be done with wisdom as well. You know, and you've got to have knowledge in the religion to do it. But on a basic level, you you can remind, you know, you say to someone, look, you know, as Muslims, you're not supposed to be doing that. And uh, that you've you've done your responsibility. Then you know you do it with tactfulness and politeness. If you feel you know, you're not even even though it's not even going to benefit, that's an act of worship for you to say that. If you've got the courage and uh, got push it, like, good glad tidings to the one who's Allah gives him that ability to even say because we're so weak this, these days, it's so difficult for us. But so the, how do we react when we're in these situations? One, if we can change it, the famous hadith, isn't it? If you can change it, then change it with your hand and not from your tongue. Or with the, the weakest of faith is that you yeah, dislike it in your heart. So first and foremost, we see what we can do. We say, you know, you shouldn't be doing this and so forth. If he says get lost and so forth, you say, alhamdulillah, I'm going to get off. 
but also that gives you strength is that you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're not in the same situation. You know, when you see all this munkar, you say, Alhamdulillah, look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he's, you know, thank, I thank Allah that he's, I'm not doing the same thing as him, I could be in the exact same situation, so that you don't become proud, because that's the dangers. When you start enjoying the good, you become Mr. Know-it-all, you know, before the shaitan's got a complete grip of you. It's so dangerous to give it a, to, to try to stand up and give advice for people. You don't realise how tricky it is. And so the one thing is that you realise that you have thanks, gratitude to Allah at the same time you do these acts. And then ultimately, then obviously through your own acts, you know, if you frequent them. And generally, it's very difficult to give advice to people or strangers. You've got to take that person in and encourage them so they get into a company of good people so they realise. Because we don't really change until we see something. We have to stop there, inshallah. But thank you very much. Alhamdulillah, haqqa hamdi wa salatu wa salamu ala maulana rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. Subhanak Allah wa bihamdik. Ashadu la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Amalna suma talamna anfusna wa illam tawfir lana wa tarhamna nakunna namina al-khasirin. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you... You forgive us our shortcomings. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come together, inshallah, for a sincere intention to change. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through us coming together, through this barakah of us coming together to remember you and remember your messenger and give us the ability to change, whereby we never go back. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're able to, we're, every day is a step forward and not a step back. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to make that change. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you bless us and bless our families and bless our children. Not students, but bless our children, if you have children. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make easy our affair. Yeah. To send the tribulation us that are able to bear. Yeah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you make us righteous, pious, noble servants of you. Not yeah. because we're deserving, but you deserve righteous servants that represent your religion truly on this earth. Yeah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that everything we do, you guide us. You give us a criteria and a forqah in order to guide us to the right path. Yeah. You show us truth as it truly is and give us the ability to follow it. You show us falsehood as it truly is and give us the ability to avoid it. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you bless the Muslim Ummah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Tunisia, we see what's happening in Egypt. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're all in euphoria, but there's difficulties as well. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you guide them towards right for them in the deen and the dunya and akhirah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make their affairs easy. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that those amongst the Ummah that are in need, Allah fulfill their needs. Those who need something fulfill, fulfill their needs. And those who are sick, Allah give them quick and speedy recovery. Those who have passed away, May, may you bless them and may you raise their stations in the next life. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who call upon you answer their prayers. Ask Allah upon those who have lost loved ones, Allah replace their sorrow and well with happiness and joy. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we all die in the full state of Iman. And our last words be La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be a light for us in the grave. Ask Allah on the day of Yom al Qiyamah, on the day of resurrection, that when the people are running to and fro, you direct us to our source of salvation that is the and there's no intercession except by his hand and all the prophets and everyone runs to him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we be amongst those who he recognizes on that day. We be amongst those who drink from his blessed and noble hand. On that drink that we never thirst from ever again on that day. On that day he embrace us. On that day he shield us from all the harms and the tribulations. And he take us by the hand and enter us into paradise when a child will be our test. And we be forever in his company in the vision of you. And what a fine company that is. Wa sallallahu ala seedina Muhammadin fatihim wa ubriqul khatim al masraq. ناس الحق من حق والهادي إلى صراط المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومن قدره العظيم سبحان الله في كرم الناس تعالى يصفون السلام على المسلمين رب العالمين أن تradition of some of the Sahabi is related to Surah Al-Asr إن شاء الله في شعب الصلاة في الصلاة they used to meet together and after when they when they went they recite Surah Al-Asr together as a reminder if we ponder on the meanings Imam Shafi says if all we were given was Surah Al-Asr it would have sufficed us. So with the love of Shaitan al-Rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Wal-Asr, Inna al-Insan al-Fiqus, Illa al-Ladina amanu wa amilu al-Salihat wa tawasaw bil-Haq wa tawasaw bil-Sab. Subhan Rabbika Rabbil Izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala al-Mursaleen. Alhamdulillah.